hello today we are going to deal with thomas hardy's the well beloved thomas hardy's well beloved is a novel that is fairly unknown or rather we can say lesser known than his far more famous uh, counterparts such as the return of the native far from the maiding maiding crowd the mayor of casterbridge and others and even test and jude which were written on either side of the well beloved the well beloved is not only one of the lesser known novels by thomas hardy but is often considered as the last novel of thomas hardy this seems strange because when we say that it seems like the last novel of thomas hardy mm, there should hardly be any question regarding what is the last novel of thomas hardy now the well beloved was written Mm, there are two versions of the well beloved that are written this written uh, the first version was written 1892 and it was published as a serial it was published as a serial this was right after tess and um, hardy was then uh, considered uh, uh, was someone who was facing loss of criticism at that time when he was actually writing the serial the well beloved or the pursuit of the well beloved as it was called the other version when it was novelized was in 1897 in 1897 it was uh, con- it was published as a novel and the, uh, there are some major changes that hardy made when he actually converted into the novel form this was not all that usual with hardy's novels this was something um, that sets the well beloved apart from other hardy novels now what were the changes that hardy actually made before we go into it let us quickly summarize this novel the novel is the story of a sculptor jocelyn pierst we are not really going into a detailed summary here a quick quick overview of what the story is about now um jocelyn pierst is a is a young sculptor who comes to the island of slingers and one of the things that he does after he comes to the island of slingers is he meets his childhood sweetheart evis and he falls in love with her and he wants to and he proposes marriage to her however this mm, this particular marriage doesn't take place because there is a ritual of premarital sex that uh, that was quite common in this in this particular island to which evis is not really keen um, is not really comfortable with and mm, pierston leaves the place he goes on to become an extremely successful sculptor 20 years later when sculpt when pierston returns to the island of slingers he he returns to the island of slingers because um he learns that avis is dead at her funeral he is surprised to see avis again if we call the first one avis the first this is avis the second now this avis the second is none other than the daughter of avis the first his childhood sweetheart and beaston is enamored by her he wants to marry her however he realizes that this avis is not really a cultured person he is slightly disgusted with the with her with what he perceives as her vulgar behavior however he still wants to marry her but it still doesn't work out and pierston leaves 20 years later when pierston returns to the island he again finds avis this is avis the third the grand daughter of avis avis the first the daughter of avis the second and he falls in love with her he takes the help of avis the second to and attempts to get married to this girl however it does not work out as avis the third elopes with her lover and in the serial verse version <coughs> pearson is um frustrated really depressed disappointed he sails out to the sea and there is a suggestion that he is um he apparently commits suicide now in the novel version hardy does not um uh, resort to that kind of tragedy he does not say that pearson is going to commit suicide he does something slightly different now what does he do 
he does not make Pearson commit suicide but on the other hand what he does is Pearson actually settles down he marries Marcia a woman that he knew right from the very beginning of the novel who is more of a friend than a lover in fact actually Pearson tells her that you are more my friend than I am than a lover yeah is what I can give you in marriage is companionship and nothing more and he marries her and after marrying Marcia one of the things that Pearson does is he says that he no longer wants to be a sculptor he gets rid of all the sculptures that he had actually sculpted so far and he says that I'm no longer going to be an artist he puts an end to this artistic vision or artistic dream that he had now the, it's on that note that the novel version ends you might say that the novel version is not tragic but I find that no less tragic than the other version where um, Pearson actually apparently commits suicide because you are we're no longer looking at someone who is committing suicide as in person but rather someone who is committing suicide as an artist there are a few interesting things that Hardy is doing here in this novel, and the and the novel has been read. While while we say that it has been ignored generally, it has been ignored when con compared to Tess and Jude and other novels. But um, it's still popular in the sense there are Lacanian interpretations, Jungian interpretations that people have come up with when they when they have read the Well Beloved. But the point that I'm really interested in is looking at two aspects of this novel. One, what is Hardy trying to do with the uh, with the understanding of, of an artist? How does Hardy understand what an artist is through this novel? How does he define an artist? That's one question that I have. The other question that I'm far more interested in, um, even more than so than this is, uh, what is Hardy's understanding of love and marriage? Because this, of course, is a constant theme in Hardy's novels, and it's not just in the Well Beloved that he's dealing with this, but in this particular novel, when he's speaking about love and marriage, this seems to be something almost um, autobiographical, not just when he speaks about artists, but also about the marriage or or the love affairs or the kind of family life that an artist can have which seems to have some kind of uh, of an autobiographical element that I want to draw think about I'm going to view this novel first and foremost um, in one sense as a as an as an allegory as an allegory when it actually deals with this aspect of an artist but before we go there the question that um, I want to ask is what's an artist? How do we generally define an artist and how are artists generally perceived in literature, portrayed in literature and is there any difference between the portrayal of artists mm, in other periods in contrast to the Victorian period? Remember The Well Beloved is a late Victorian novel and in that sense we might read it as a novel in transition from Victorian to modernism, right? From Victorianism to modernism. So, uh, when we say that this is a novel that mm, that uh, that deals with mm, the, with an artist, an artist has generally been viewed in literature as a prophet. Now, why a prophet? Now, a prophet for the simple reason the artist comments on society there is a commentary on society that he comes up with and he then he prophesies where in which direction society is going to progress that's what the role of an artist is or at least that's how literature has perceived uh, literature's perception of artist has always been so that the artist can be viewed as a prophet but to be a prophet one of the things that the artist has to do then is to stay away from society because to comment on society one of the things that the artist needs needs to do is get a get an objective vision of society and for this objective vision for this objective perspective on society one thing that the um, or the, the artist has to do is 
<coughs> sorry one thing the artist has to do is he has to view society from a perspective where he is not just um, an outsider in one sense he's all also treated by society as an outcast now the outsider or the outcast as you turn the artist as because he's a prophet also results in the artist when he comes up with unpalatable truths when he comes up with unpalatable truths making statements that society does not really like quite often the artist then is viewed as an eccentric and as he's an outcast uh, as he is an outsider he is forgiven for his eccentricities there is that kind of sanction that the author has the kind of poem um, space that the artist is given where he can actually speak um, against society however such uh, permission that is given to artists is not um, endless even even recent cases such as the fatwas that are issued against Salman Rushdie or Taslima Nasreen show that artists only have so much freedom what you term as the freedom of speech but we will not go there for the minute we let us just stick to Thomas Hardy's well beloved one thing that um, we are seeing is that if the artist is viewed uh, from the such perspective this prophet this outcast this outsider when he is making these statements the society just like uh, the the two references that had given of recent writers in the same way the society always jumps in while they're saying that they are they have been given that kind of freedom to speak about society these artists are also judged by the mores of society so that this artist often finds himself in a kind of world where he has to uh, question why he's doing whatever he's doing this comes through in the character of Thomas Hardy's pierced. For instance, if you are going to have that integrity, if you are going to be really sincere and follow your your art with that sense of perceptiveness, you might be a successful author, you might be a successful artist, but this successful artist might not really have a successful life. A proper family life that's one of the things that hardy seems to be suggesting here why do we say that now hardy along with pierce turn in this novel also creates a parallel character alfred somers alfred somers a painter who is extremely popular but somers unlike pierce turn is hardly bothered by what he terms as the muse his just interested in coming up with products that appeal to his customers in other words from far from being an artist he has turned into a craftsman hardy seems to suggest that if you lose your integrity you are successful because uh, somos also goes on to make a successful marriage he marries him a rich woman and and is settled happily by the end of the novel unlike our peers. Uh, one of the statements that Soma says when he is speaking about Pearson is, uh, he tells Pearson that you are not, you are exceedingly perceptive and that seems to be a problem and the reason why Soma is saying this, I am paraphrasing the quote of course, that all men are perceptive, you are more perceptive than others and this perceptive are in one is in one sense your problem that's what you so that's what soma says to be and the problem with that particular statement of somas when he is referring to um to pearson is pearson has to be perceptive if he is an artist but if he is perceptive he can't really have a happy family life so that what hardy finds himself uh, says that Pearson finds himself in is he finds himself in in a, in a kind of world which where where he's faced with this catch-22 situation he doesn't really have much of a choice to be an artist he needs to be perceptive but to actually lead a happy life he needs to be less perceptive 
so that the choice is between being perceptive and being an artist or being non-perceptive and not being an artist. What Hardy seems to suggest here, and I think uh, this, is a, this is quite an important statement that Hardy is making in contrast to other novels, will come, uh, other Victorian novels, is that the artist um, cannot really have a normal life. An artist cannot really have a normal life. Now, you know, when we speak about a novels which deal with the growth of an artist, we call them Kunzler Romas. We all know this. Now, the Kunzler Roma is a um, is a term that is used for novels which show how a person grows on to actually do justice to his artistic muse, to the artistic ability that is ingrained in him. That's what the novels are about. Now, from what Hardy is doing here, we are seeing that these kun, that a Kunzla Roma or a, or a novel that deals with the growth of an artist is the antithesis of a Bildung's Roma. This, this is a serious statement to make. Now, what do we mean by this? A Bildung's Roma is a growing up novel of how a person grows on to become a part of the society. We keep thinking of Kunzla Romas as a part of Buildings Roma because we are saying an artist goes on to do justice to his artistic ability and after he does justice to his artistic ability he finds that he that he has grown up and become a part of society, he understands the society. Charles Dickens' David Copperfield is a prime example where um, Copperfield grow, grows up understands the world around him and after he grows up and understands the world one of the things that um, Dickens shows by the end of the novel is Copperfield with his family um, happily settled in a home along with his wife children and he's also a successful novelist now this image of a successful artist as well as a successful family man as um, Dickens creates is completely against the idea that Hardy is projecting here. Hardy's image is more in keeping with, more in tune with something such as Mrs. Huntingdon Down's image in Anne Brontë's The Tenant of Wildfell Hall. Again, a painter who is viewed by her neighbors as someone of who is eccentric, who is weird, and someone that no one understands is even more in tune with 20th century characters such as um, 20th century works such as James Joyce the, in the portrait of an artist as an young man or Joyce carries horse's mouth now the reason why we are saying hard disk novel are closer to these is because they show the kind of difficulties that the artist has to face in the real world and that makes the novel extremely realistic now getting back to the point that we are seeing that this is a novel that that can be read as an allegory. The three avises, the three avises that um, Joyce, uh, Jocelyn Pearson falls in love with, the uh, avis the first, avis the second and avis the third, the, the three of them can be seen to represent three stages in an artist's career. The first avis is idealism, is virtue, is the ideal that Jocelyn had fallen in love with, what he actually aspires to, just like an artist when he sets out to become an artist has this utopian idea or utopian ideals that he is trying to achieve through his art, Jocelyn falls in love with uh, avis the first who is virtuous and the ideal, now why do we call her the ideal? Quite simply because she is also shown as the person who, in contrast to the kind of world that she comes from, is someone who is cultivated, who is cultured, and secondly, along with being cultured, someone who, uh, who is educated, um, she is also someone who is who, who believes that her virtue is something that is extremely important and she doesn't want to lose it by participating in or the premarital sense that Jocelyn was interested in. Now that's the ideal that we speak of. 
now the second one um, is when jocelyn is more successful is when he is more successful in other words as a sculpture when we say that his um, his success equates with being able to come up with products that his customers wanted this something that hardy does not really speak about in great detail actually hardy does not detail tell us in detail how um, what jocelyn does he speaks about him as a sculptor but how does he actually go about um, doing his work what are the things that he actually believes in what what the amount of effort that is going that he puts in for, to come up with these various images none of these are things that um, hardy ever deals with in one sense he keeps it off stage and there's a reason i think that he does this because while he does not tell us what jocelyn is going through when he is coming up with this sculptures it's almost as if by magic he's performed and the magic that he performs becomes crucial because this magic that um, jocelyn had uh, performs in, in coming up with the sculptures results in the sculpture that we are speaking about the sculptures that the customers really enjoy customers love so that he becomes a successful sculpt, sculptor mainly in the second period now this is also the period of avis the second avis the second is not as virtuous as avis the first she is not the ideal she stands for promiscuity as we referred to earlier jocelyn finds her vulgar and this vulgarity or her tendency to have multiple fas a promiscuity these are two things that hardy refers to here suggest and in one the something that um, correlates to jocelyn's own successful career as a sculptor around that period because Jocelyn was also able to satisfy numerous customers with his sculptures and thus why had become successful around this period. The third one is have is the third and have is the third quite significantly is some some uh, is also at a point when Jocelyn realizes himself that this probably is not going to work even though when um have is the second tries to help him with this he is not really keen he is not really sure that it's going to help and the statements that have as the third makes which um are supposedly ironic but are but are true or um make jocelyn rethink what had been uh, what had been aspiring for now what does have as the third say have the third when she knows about jocelyn pierston's earlier love affairs she shocked she says were you my great grandmother's lover too one of the questions that as the third asks now that would have been funny if um, asked it by anyone else but the fact here is jocelyn was already in love with avis the third's mother as well as grandmother that comes across as something that's almost ridiculous and this it would it's it would have been funny and ridiculous if Jocelyn there wasn't something pathetic about Jocelyn's desire for love need for love now Jocelyn even though have as a second tries to help him realizes that this is not really going to work out because by then he realizes that have as the third is probably one two and for him secondly that his love is doomed for failure is doomed to fail now <coughs> this understanding of jocelyn combined with his um, the fact that i was the third actually elopes with her lover at the time when jocelyn is supposed to marry her show her to be the muse that had finally left jocelyn so allegorically what have the third stands for is this muse which had been at the beginning an ideal which has turned into something that was almost promiscuous something that he could actually sell mm -hmm. into third a muse that had fled him altogether so that after that there is nothing left for jocelyn but actually gave up his art 
whether he, by committing suicide or whether by actually giving up his heart as he does in the novel version is a different matter altogether but that's how we i want to read it allegorically now when we say that we are reading it allegorically it might seem that this novel comes across as a as a fantasy and hardy himself had called this novel a romance not one of his serious works but he turns it as a romance as a fans as a fantasy and um as if to underscore this these three abysses that are present uh, seem to suggest that this this is something akin to a fairy tale now why do we say that it is something akin to a fairy tale the number three has lots of importance uh, in fairy tales quite often generally it is three wishes three curses three boons things seem to happen in threes the reason for this are many but whether it's in big vika tradition or paganism hinduism many most religious mythologies three is highly significant whether it is in the christian mythology and we are looking at the trinity of the some father son and the holy ghost or whether it, we are looking at it from the hindu mythology and we speak about the trinity again brahma vishnu and maheshwar you are you are looking at threes that are extremely important one reason one simple explanation seemingly simple explanation that we have for why three is chosen is not because mm, it goes against your idea of binaries that there only there is either a yes or a no or a white or black but there is something in between so that there is not as if we have balanced or evened out everything that's one explanation but the second one Uh, that had come across um, is that you are looking at the past, present, and future as three, and these three, in other words, eternity, past, present, and future, as signifying eternity, and that's why the three that is quite commonly used as as something that is significant, whether. <coughs> it is in the in fairy tales in mythologies in folklore wherever that we are looking at hart even he is actually dealing with this concept of three in the well beloved seems to pull it into this realm of fantasy into the realm of romance that he man says that it is however um the well beloved if it is read as such an eerie romance as as a as nothing better than a fairy tale um there is great chance of it being ignored and the reason why i'm saying this and i insist that um this this becomes seriously problematic is quite simple because in contrast to the two novels that um, that are published um, right before the well beloved by thomas hardy Tess and the Jew, Tess and Jew, the obscure. Both those novels are extremely serious novels, and there's a lot of serious discourse that has happened on those novels. And the serious discussions in those novels is about the significance of life, the significance of ambition in Jude, which becomes an important question, or the futility of ambition. Now. i believe that the well beloved asks similarly pertinent questions similarly pertinent questions do mask them do written in such a manner that they are not as sensationalist as hardy's other two novels now when i say they are hardly that the well beloved is not as sensationalist as hardy's mm, two novels the other two novels of the 1890s mm, i'm stretching a point it is sensationalist when we actually think there is this man who actually falls in love with a girl her daughter and her granddaughter that that does seem sensationalist however that that no way compares with the kind of sensationalism that you you associate with the hardy of test where a girl goes on to murder her one time husband a we like in jude where a group of children commit suicide 
these are things that are grossly sensationalist they're grotesque that's what we find strangely missing from the well beloved and that's that's actually a point in its favor that it's not grotesque that is not gross no i'm sorry if if i'm hurting fans of tess and jude but those two instances in those two novels make them slightly grotesque in one sense if you forget such grotesque elements um, those novels seem as if they're asking far more significant questions but the well below asks equally significant questions as i just pointed out because when it asking about ambition we have to think about Jocelyn Pearson's ambition. After having read this as an allegory and seeing that there is a tendency to read this as a romance or a fantasy or a, or a fairy tale, one of the things that we keep forgetting is it is asking a seriously significant question by saying, what price ambition? Pearson is ambitious to become a successful artist. But this ambition he can only achieve if he actually mm, forgets about his own personal happiness if he may if he compromises on a regular basis and once he compromises in his um in his personal life these compromises would affect his artistic endeavor is what hardy seems to suggest here now that that's something that's almost autobiographical here as far as hard is concerned because if you remember after the well beloved <coughs> one hardy moved away from writing novels mainly because he refused to compromise in one sense that might be the reason because it's not as if he stopped being an artist but he refused to compromise and write the kind of novels that people uh, that the critics and the public wanted the critics and public had serious problems with what was included in Jude and Tess and Hardy to coffins with the kind of scath and criticism that he got from the from the public so that he in, in well below it seems almost as if he's coming to terms with this new reality that I can't compromise with my art so let me actually move to a different genre a different form of writing and he moved to poetry Poetry and the well beloved is in one sense almost as if it's a it's a precursor to the kind of poetry that Hardy wrote later. Now why do we say it's a precursor to the kind of poetry that Hardy wrote later? Because the the kind of lyricism that Thomas Hardy includes in the well beloved, and I'm not just talking about the kind of language structures that he's using here, but more than the language, the way these characters are depicted each character whether it is Pearson, the three avises whether it is alfred Somers, whether it is marcia that jocelyn finally marries all these characters in the novel come across as types as allegorical symbols something that were more of um, used to associating with in poetry than in prose in contrast earlier hardy characters whether it is Tess, Jude, Henchard you know, all these characters do not come across as types they are distinctive individuals you might say argue that that that's one of the reasons why the well beloved is one of his weaker novels but I would say that rather than viewing it as a weaker novel we should view it as a stronger poem that's one way of reading it. The other way is it also can be read as as a as a novel that um, that shows Hardy uh, as as someone who is who is in this mode of transition from writing a novel to writing poetry, but far more significantly from the Victorian ideals to a modernist ideal. Now, what do we mean by this? The Victorian ideals of compromising that we see quite often. Well. Uh, with Dickensian novels and we'll soon be looking at hard times in this regard and the kind of compromises that Dickens actually speaks about in, in hard times. If the Dickensian or the Victorian novel is something that dealt with compromises, this is a novel that speaks about people taking up 
paths that are less traveled by moving into this that remains one of frost but then i'm not dealing with frost we're, we're mainly looking at hardy from a perspective where we are saying that this movement this direction that hardy is taking then becomes a precursor to modernism further as we go um, along this line one of the things that um, i'm interested in is if we are saying this this is the kind of transition that uh, hardy hardy is making from victorianism to modernism from um, what you term as novel to what is poetry the the important question that we need to ask is what exactly then is the well beloved is it evis evis the first evis the second or evis the third or is it his art or is it his muse is it his ideals his in the sense jocelyn pearson's or is it something else these are the questions that hardy um, in the novel when he's answering also shows us uh, what actually constitute a victorian text now what do we mean by this when we say that the well beloved the title seemingly at one level it refers to avis or uh, or avis the first or the muse that mm, jocelyn pearson has is also suggests something that is forever and ever out of the artist's reach it's an ideal that's forever beyond him that's why remember the earlier title was something like the pursuit of the well beloved it's not so much the well beloved that hardy is interested in but rather the pursuit of the well beloved now this pursuit is is something that can that will go on until the artist finally resigns himself to the fact that this can't be achieved in this in this world in the corporeal world to achieve this dream to achieve to succeed in attaining what you had aspired for the ideal remember the ideal is always for for hardy as he's depicting here a utopian ideal the ideal that you can never achieve and and quite often you make this compromises now we say that this is a victorian text in the sense that there is a compromise that so much for instance who becomes a representation of this victorian male who who makes this compromise and who settles down and has a happy life as well as be, um, have a what you might term as a successful career a successful career as well as a happy life that was that's possible for alfred somers jocelyn pearson's friend is the kind of life that jocelyn has turned his back on and hardy when we read this as an autobiographical novel has done something similar the other aspect that um, the final the last thing that i want to deal with when we are looking at this novel is um, the concept of realism Now, what is realism? When we say that this is a novel that can be read as a romance or a folklore or fantasy or whatever that we call call it, or even go by the terms that Hardy is using and say that it's a romance, mm, we keep forgetting that this is very much a part of the Victorian realist tradition of novel writing. But firstly, what is realism? realism remember is depicting things as they really are quite simple definition things as they really are but who says how things are that's the rafa mo troubling question right now when we say that we are looking at things from a perspective one uh, and this perspective whoever is coming up with this narrative whether it is a third person narrative whether it's a first person narrative this is a perspective that is involved with each narrative so the realism is always limited am i making sense now let me let me um, go back a bit realism is often selective for instance if i'm asked to depict what is happening in any particular time 
I am only going to select a few instances or select a few events and say these are the only things that had happened not necessarily these are the only things but we have create a hierarchy of events and say that these are the things that I find significant these are the things that I feel are have to be depicted so that a realist novel often goes with the sense that you are privileging the narrator to a point you are only seeing a certain perspective in the case of the well beloved when i say this this isn't really a novel we are not talking so much of the narrator here but rather uh, <coughs> when we say that it is it does privilege jocelyn pearson's feelings emotions it hardly pays enough attention to what avis the first had felt avis the second had felt or avis the third had felt it also speaks about the kind of limitations that are imposed on hardy himself when he is actually writing such a novel because uh, hardy has to think about what can be po possible in the real world when he is writing such a novel the second part of realism now what are the things that are permissible in reality there are things that are possible which when you are actually speaking about in fiction quite often have to be excluded that is understandable because you are looking for what you term as normative what is considered normative it's not really considered normal for a 60 year old man to actually marry a 20 year old girl quite often it's not as if it doesn't happen it does in hardy's own case that was what happened soon after the publication of the well beloved and he married that day but this such a happening is ruled out to a major extent in fiction for it to actually fall into the tradition of what is real what is acceptable so the real the realist novel is also something that is acceptable something that is considered as part of the normative the well beloved when we think of it as a tragedy in the serial version where jocelyn pierce and finally after failing a third time to achieve whatever he wanted to achieve to basically get married to this girl goes on to commit suicide tragedy enough the second in the novel version jocelyn pierce and this resigns to his fate gives up art breaks all the sculptures and is finally married that is tragedy as well i guess for hardy or at least that's what hardy seems to suggest i'm not going to suggest anything but yeah that's what hardy is saying here that your artist who is who gives up his art and that is tragic your artist was compromised that is tragic your artist was married and that is tragic probably for hardy that is also the real Thank you.